Hey, I want to I want to talk to you a little bit this morning. Um, we talked a couple weeks. By the way, I want to thank publicly thank Josh Willoughby, his wife, for being here. They had a little break from being in Ecuador uh, the last couple weeks, and the work they're doing there is important, and the way he's doing it is important. And I appreciate uh, his mindset about missions and the and the way that the way that he's helping uh, the people of of Ecuador. So uh, just remember them in your prayers, and we support them. Uh, and, and we believe in the gospel going far and wide. Amen. That's an exciting thing. He's got a neat story. We talked two weeks ago, we talked about morality. We're still in this tug of war conversation about morality and um, where it comes from. Where does right and wrong come from? It's got to come from somewhere. Because I don't know about you, but there's some, everybody's got their opinion about what's right and wrong. And if we don't, if we don't, reconcile the fact that right and wrong has to transcend the people following it. Amen? If that wasn't the case, your three-year-old could make up right and wrong. If it didn't, trans, if it didn't transcend the people that are, that are supposed to be following what, what's right and wrong, then it can adjust by the minute. So we establish that, that the reality is that God is the creator of all things and he's the only one that doesn't change. So in order to have an objective re, uh, morality or right and wrong, we need first a God who doesn't change. And we established that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he is not a man that he should lie, that he doesn't change, that there is no, that there is no back and forth with him, that he is who he is, his character is permanent, and his will is permanent. And so we established that because of that, then, then he established morality, what is right and wrong. All right, maybe I should preach that one again. Be, it's so important to, get, to be at that spot where you go, okay, there is a permanent right and wrong. Because here's the issue. At the end of the day, God is, we are not gonna be judged according to what our culture determined was right and wrong. Amen? We're gonna be held to a permanent standard on that. And thankfully, God, God loved the world so much that he sent Jesus to be, to be our sacrifice. And so we are covered and made new and set free and given freedom in Christ but the standards haven't changed. So um, Paul would say, should we sin that grace may have, but like we got Jesus now, now we can go on and do everything. No, 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 he said, don't do that. that. That right and wrong is still right and wrong. And just because we have grace doesn't mean we ignore right and wrong. As a matter of fact, we're gonna dig into that part of it today. Look at your neighbor and say, we're gonna figure out our part today. We're gonna figure out our part today. Now we're gonna talk about sins. So that's the last time I want you to look at them. Because it may get weird. Because if God has established right and wrong, and that's a permanent established principle, right and wrong, it doesn't change. It doesn't change with culture, it doesn't change with time, it doesn't change with technology. It's the, the, the law is the law according to God. It is still wrong to have an affair. Amen. 50% of you totally agree with that. It is still wrong to murder. It is still wrong to covet. Amen. Okay. So if that's the case, then we have to be the ones that live according to that law. Now we get forgiven, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me, there's forgiveness. But Paul would say, should we keep sinning? And we're gonna find out that it's actually our responsibility not to sin. So I ate a Boston cream donut this morning, just one. I only ate one. It's my responsibility not to eat two. Are you following me? I could have eaten two because there was two in the box. 
Actually, there was three in the box, wasn't there? There was three in the box. And my, my lovely wife got them yesterday, and they were just for me. She didn't really care for Boston Cream Donuts that much. They're, they're okay to her. They are food from heaven for me. And so when we went to Mike's Pastry, I was like, oh my, oh my Lord, they have Boston Cream Donuts at Mike's Pastry. We're in Boston. That's where the cream came from. Um, so there's these glazed donuts with chocolate on them. They don't inject them. They cut them in half and they put this much Boston cream in the middle of them. And we got two of them and they're like this big. And if anybody, my birthday is April 13th. We figured out they're good three days later. It's our responsibility. Look at your neighbor and say, it's our responsibility. But I'm gonna show you how we're supposed to do it this morning and where we get the power to do it. You're not powerless when it comes to sin. Stand to your feet, we're gonna read from Romans chapter eight and then we're gonna read from Colossians chapter three, Paul saying the same thing. In his letter to the Romans, he says this is chapter eight, verse 12. So then brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Then we're going to skip to Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ who is your life appears, then also, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Does that sound familiar? Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. He's given us a warning. In these you too once walked, when you were living in them, but now you must put all them, put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And then he goes on to say what to put on as God's chosen ones. What that, what that looks like, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. We're gonna deal with the put to death part today. Are you ready? So Father, we ask you, Lord, to soften our hearts and minds. And Lord, help us take responsibility for what you've asked us to do, to live holy and righteous lives before you in your power, we can do that. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. I, um, I've been thinking about this recently. You know, everybody says, well, there's no perfect church. That's true, right? No perfect church. And they say, well, if you show up, then it won't be perfect. The issue is we have, we have done this thing in, in modern church where we, where we acknowledge that, but then we take it a step further and we say, this, well, man, I just go to a church full of sinners, full of sinners. Almost like, almost like we have no say in it. That we're, that we're, yes, we've all fallen and come short of the glory of God and, and we know we sin and we know we do that, but it's like, it's almost become like a badge of honor. Like, oh man, my church is full of sinners. Well, that's not going to work out at some point in time. Like, could I know how bad it is before I show up? Like, are they actively robbing banks? Like, what, what, is the, what is the extent to which the church you attend is sinners? Can we have, do you do background checks on everybody? 
And we've kind of bought into this thing that we need to reduce the standard to attract more people. We're all sinners, yes. We're all active sinners, probably. Are we all okay with that? Hopefully not. Should it be a badge of honor to attract other people? Heavens no. Could you imagine if you had a problem with alcoholism and, you're, and the group that you were with said, hey, listen, we're all just alcoholics. We might as well meet at the bar. And the church is taking this weird stance on it. Like, we're all just sinners. Come along with us and we'll be sinners making sort of an effort. What if we looked at people and said, hey, we are sinners just like you, but we know what freedom feels like. And that's a totally different story, isn't it? And I think some of the reason that, the, that people have, have gone away from the church, forget COVID and all that stuff, is because they've come in and not seen really any difference in what we would call righteousness than what they experience outside. And that's because we've kind of dumbed it down. What is our expectation? Oh, we just love on Jesus. Actually, it's more than that. And the Apostle Paul, he writes to the Romans in AD 57, then he writes to the church in Colossia in his first imprisonment in Rome uh, about, let's call it five, five years later, four or five years later, he writes, and he's writing the same words, put to death. Put to death living by the flesh. Put to death the sin that's in you. Put to death. Put it to death. Now, now you realize that's a directive that he's telling people to do. He's not saying sit around and wait and God will eliminate it from your life. He's not even saying pray that God eliminates sin from your life. Did you catch that? He didn't say pray to the Lord and he will remove the sin from your life. He said you put it to death. And we've talked about this before and this is, you know, this, this is where everybody's like, oh, he's going to talk about, he's going to talk about my problem today. Probably just calm down. We're all, we're all moving towards this direction. It's not something we can ignore. Amen? If we're going to talk about morality, then we've got to talk about what do we do with it. If we're going to talk about there's an objective right and wrong, then we've got to talk about, well, what is our responsibility towards that objective right and wrong? What is our responsibility to do with what we would call sin in our lives? If God is labeling what's wrong as sin, then we have a responsibility then to acknowledge and do something about it as his followers. Amen? Amen? All right. So we get into this thing that we call sanctification. Anybody heard that word before, sanctification? Uh, the rest of you are like, here we go. Okay, sanctification is a churchy word. It's a religious word that means, simply means to be set apart. Set apart. Sanctification means set apart. Now, we happen to believe that there's kind of like three steps to the sanctification process, and we're in one of the steps. So, so there's a, a, sanct, a part of sanctification that happens when you come to Christ. Just lean in for a second. It's going to get better. There's part of sanctification that happens when you come to Christ. The Bible says that you've been bought with a price, that, that Jesus paid his life for you, that you've been now made heirs with Christ. You've been set apart, and you've been given new life. Are you following me? So there's a portion that like you've been set apart as a follower of Christ. You've been, you've been made new and you've been given new life. You've inherited eternal life. If you, if you come to Jesus on the cross, like the thief that was on the cross, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, he didn't have a whole lot of time to reject sin. But even at that point, he was given new life and he would be made, he, he would inherit eternal life with Jesus. Okay. Are you following me? So he was set apart in that, in, in that in being saved. Now we get to what we would call progressive sanctification. That means it's a process happening. And that's where we are. We are being set apart. And part of that responsibility is ours, and we'll talk about where we get the power to accomplish that in a second. So we have been set apart by Jesus, but now we're living and we are being set apart. We are being what we would call we're being sanctified. 
And then the last part of sanctification is what we would call glorification, where, where Paul would say, in, when, we are, when we die and we resurrect, or, or if, like we used to say in the old church, if the Lord tarries, and I kept thinking, who's Terry? But that doesn't mean, you know, waits. If the Lord waits, then, then all of us are going to, it is appointed a man wants to die. Amen? Everybody's going to. I just heard on the radio the other day that there's some billionaire that takes 100 pills a day and, and only eats 2,000 calories and doesn't eat anything past 11 o'clock and he thinks he's going to live forever. Hey, you know what? I'm not a billionaire, but I got some information for you. You might as well stop taking the pills. <laughs> it's coming, bro. So when we die, we, we in Christ, we are, we are given this guarantee of eternity with him and a guarantee of a new resurrected body, a glorified body where there is no pain. It's perfect. We are made holy. And that's the in form of sanctification. You are made totally sanctified at that moment. Come on, wouldn't that be nice? But we're in the middle now. We're in the progressive part. We're in the part where some of it is our responsibility. And so we're going to lean into that. You put to death the flesh. We see this pattern in, when he writes to the Colossians. If then you have been raised with Christ, that means you put your faith in Christ and he's made you new. Do you see that part? That's the first part. Then he says in verse 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. So he says, you've been set apart. Now you continue to set yourself apart. Do you, you see that? Progressive. And then verse 4, he says, when Christ, who is, in, is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's the final act of sanctification, where you're glorified with Christ. So you see where we get that pattern. Now. Let's talk about where we are. We are literally living in the put to death phase. Look at your neighbor and say, put it to death. Put it to death. I'm not talking about cats. I'm talking about sin. <laughs> For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Colossians 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. So listen, this has nothing to do with our culture or what our neighbors are doing. This, is, this has everything to do with the unchanging holiness of God. Right and wrong are determined by God, and I think we've established that. And that is an unchanging standard to guide us. And listen, that should free us up a little bit, shouldn't it? Isn't it easier to follow laws that don't change? That's why nobody wants to be an accountant. That's why nobody wants to like, well, what's the government regulation on this? I don't know. It changes every like 30 seconds. I have no idea. I have no idea. Because the, because the rules change over and over and over. Listen, God never changed the rules. He just never did. They were perfect when he established them. So why would he change them? Hey, listen, shouldn't covet. Fast forward thousands of years. Guess what's not good for us? Coveting. Hey, don't have any other gods before me. That's still not a good idea. Don't, don't murder. I think we can all agree. That's still a bad idea. Still wrong. And so the thing that frees us up is that it doesn't change. So what the church has to do, remember this tug of war between church and culture. You know, what, you know what's ha being said now, don't you? Of the fundamentalist. Because we believe in something that doesn't change. Because progressive people and intelligent people can rationalize why you would need to commit adultery. I mean, after all. Why you, would, why you would break God's laws. There's a rationality for all of it because if you come over here, look, this is where all the smart people are. We can look at it and, 
and kind of debate it and come up with the best alternative. And what do we get for it? it never, it's not getting better. Anybody raise their hand if you think it's all getting better. Don't do that. I think we can agree it's not getting better. And as we progressively move away from what God established as unchanging, then it continues to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. All right. So we are in the put to death phase. So Paul is showing us our role in this part of sanctification or being set apart. We now have the responsibility to put sin to death. It's an act, we are supposed to be active in this. It's part of what we do on a daily basis. James 4, chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. Did you hear that? He says, don't play, don't play pickleball with him. Resist him. Don't play around. Resist him. And he will flee from you. Do you know why the devil doesn't flee from us? Because we don't put up any resistance. We're like, stop it. You know what? We need to put up some resistance. Come on, church. 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from every form of evil. Does that sound like it's equivocating? 2 Timothy 2.22, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual, sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And why is that such a big deal? Because he, he established that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when we commit sexual sins, we're committing that against the, the, the temple that God resides in. It's defiling it. So all the way through the New Testament, we see it's our responsibility, our responsibility, our responsibility to resist sin, to put sin to death. Say amen. There's a personal responsibility to avoid sin. We on purpose adhere to a morality that's given to us by God through Christ. It's not a restriction. Oh, okay. I, I remember thinking this when I was growing up. Man, we go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Tuesday night was youth group. Wednesday night was another youth group named a different thing. And, um, and I used to think, all these people do is tell me what not to do. Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And I used to think growing up, well, ain't none of this fun. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay. I was never told what I could do. I was told what I couldn't do. That, that was a church mentality. Like, you're going to hell. I already know that. So, as the church, I'm not coming to you this morning going, this is a restrictive thing. And I'm going to give you 15 things that you better never do. You're going straight to hell. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it was portrayed to me in the wrong way. I should have been told this is what freedom looks like, Chris. You are ultimately the most free when you're not a slave to sin. You are ultimately the most free when you can say no to sin. Do you, know what the, do you know what the most important word in any business deal is? No. Remember that. The most important thing in any business deal is being able to look at somebody and go, nope, not taking it. You know what that tells them? I'm free to do whatever I want. I'm free here. And what we do as individuals is we look and we go, oh, all those restrictions are there. God's just as approved and he doesn't want me to have any fun. No, God's over here going, if you want to be free, follow the laws that don't change. There ain't a ton of them. Just follow the ones that don't change. But it's, 
It's unbelievable that we, as even as believers, we, we run over here to culture that changes every 30 seconds and we want to adhere to those laws. And we end up becoming enslaved to what everybody else thinks is right. And that changes and changes and changes. And, and you just, I can't keep up. God says, I'm, I'll never change on you. What's right, what's right yesterday will be right today. What's wrong yesterday will be wrong today. And I'll give you the power to do it. And yet we trade that because we say, oh, it's so restrictive. So restrictive. No, we should be looking. At our communities are going, hey, if, if you want to be free, if you want to be really free, do it this way. Could you say we're a church full of sinners? Yes. I'd rather relabel that. We're a church full of free people. We're a church full of free people because do we sin? The truth is yes. But we are held to this unchanging standard that ends up freeing us at the end of the day. It's a different story, amen? Now, how many of you have tried not to sin and sinned anyway. Come on, raise your hand. Be proud of it. Leo, let's go. Come on, let me see across the room. Some of you are like, no, when I, when, I, when I don't want to sin, I don't do it. I do everything on purpose. <laughs> All right. Even the Apostle Paul said, the things I don't want to do, I do, and the things I want to do, I don't do. Like this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We've all experienced that, right? Like I know what's right, and I didn't do it. And I know what's wrong, and I ended up doing it. But it felt good. And we go all the way back to the Old Testament, and we find out that sin is pleasurable for a season. Hey, by the way, can we just stop it as, as church people, like sin isn't fun? <laughs> you must ain't sinned in a while. Because it's fun at the beginning. Or you wouldn't do it. The devil doesn't entice us with things that aren't enticing. He can't tempt me with Brussels sprouts. <laughs> like, come on, Chris, do it. I'll give you some Brussels sprouts. And I'm like, you better come back with something better, bro. I ain't doing it for Brussels sprouts. A boss of cream donut, I'll kill somebody. <laughs> the two of them, I'll bury the body. Like, I'll just... <laughs> Are you following me? So watch this. We all realize that in and of ourselves, we lack the power to consistently do this. Is that true? That's true. In and of ourselves, we lack the power to consistently do it. Or we could be made righteous by ourselves. If you were able to not sin, you would not need Jesus. So that we're not talking about that here. We're talking about responsibility, not where the power comes from. So we talked about responsibility, that it is our responsibility at this part of, at this part of the sanctification process. Paul is saying, you put sin to death. You stop sinning. You flee youthful desires. You do this. All right. He's putting the responsibility on us. Then we find out that we're able to do this, not in our own strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Everybody in the room has tried not to sin in their own strength. And a lot of times it doesn't work out. Everybody in the room. Here's where the church started going wrong with the sin thing. Is we, we let people pray, Lord, take this from me. That's what we started We'd, we'd let people pray that. Lord, take this sin for me. Take this sin for me. Take this sin for me. And I don't find that in there. I find Paul telling us to put it to death. So we wanted God to take something from us that he wanted to give us the power to kill. Are you with me? Are you following it? Okay, we, we wanted, can I just say this, by the way? If God would just take it from us, it'd be a lot easier. Wouldn't it? Every time you thought about sinning, oh, God, take it from me. Take it from me, take it from me, take it from me. And then if you sin, take it from me. I don't ever want to do that again. None of us would, be, none of us would ever sin again. Because if it was just that. But there's this personal responsibility part that he's put on us. And it, and it is correlated to our relationship 
with him. Now, now are you following me? So Paul says, should we go on sinning that grace may abound? Should we just keep sinning because there's grace out there? No, because what that does is that negates the relationship. So God created us for a relationship. Jesus died for us because of relationship. And so now he wants us to resist sin and to put sin to death in the context of that relationship. So the issue is if we could just whip him up like a genie and go, hey, get it out of here. We don't need a relationship. If I could just say one prayer, Lord, don't let me sin like that anymore. And it'd be over. I don't need, I don't need a relationship. That's a text message. But he he gives us the power to resist sin through the relationship. Now are you following me? All right. We're given the power to do it through that relationship. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit, how do we put the deeds of the body to death? By the Okay, good. It's like the third line down. I don't know if everybody could read it. Thanks, Justin. <laughs> For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So how do we put to death the deeds of the body? By the Spirit. Not by your own will, not by your own determination, not by your own strength, but by the Spirit. By the the Spirit dwelling in us through our relationship with God, he empowers us then to put the death the deeds of the body. Romans 8, chapter 5 says, or chapter 8, verse 5 says the same thing. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. There's a relationship there. We're in communication. We're back and forth. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For the, It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit of, is life because of righteousness. The Spirit of him, I love this, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. That relationship dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through the spirit who dwells in you. The ultimate power of God is in us to resist sin. All right. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit we're able to know what is right and what is wrong and then do the right thing. This is why it is so pivotal for us to be in relationship with God. We have, um, and, and you, you know this is a little pet peeve of mine. Um, we, have a, we have a little program that we've been getting people to get on called the carry app and you read a chapter of the bible a day chapter of the bible a day it literally might take five minutes a chapter i think it's important amen i think it's important to read i think it's important to spend time i think it's important it's important because that's where we receive the power to resist are you following me? Okay. A verse a day in the morning, you know, like, oh, yeah. Verse a day in the morning, got my little Bible app, reminds me. Verse of the day, and I'm like, ooh, yeah. I don't even know what it means. Come on, you realize you could read a verse a day for the rest of your life and not know what 90% of it means because it's just plucked out. Just like you could take... Uh, sometimes I tell people I say a lot of dumb things on Sunday morning. You could extract one sentence out of this sermon and make it and, and use it in a way that's not applicable to what I said in the whole thing. So we get into this place 
where God is trying to draw us to himself so that he can empower us to live a holy and righteous life, to put to death the sin, sin in our lives, to, for us to have the power to put it to death. He's trying to draw us to himself and, and we're resisting the wrong thing. Isn't that the irony? The very thing that could set us free from death, we resist. Oh, the Bible. Ooh. Like, I wish it was more like a comic book. You know what's crazy? You can get the Bible in a comic book form. I wish it was easier to read. There's five million different translations of it. You can read it. You can get, you can get a movie star to read it for you. You can get anybody. I'll read it for you. I don't, I don't think I want to do that. We resist the relationship and then end up not being able to resist sin. When God wants us to lean into the relationship so that we can resist sin. Because he understands that as long as we're resisting the wrong thing, we will never experience freedom. And so he's going, hey, I put it out there for you. I gave it to you. I want to spend time with you. I, I want you to lean into this. Because this is the hinge pin on you being able to live a holy life on you being able to resist the thing that's tying you up. Acts chapter 13, verse, verse 49 and 52. Paul, Paul is being, um, Paul and Barnabas are being persecuted and it says the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region but the Jews incited the devout women of the high standing and leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook the dust off from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So in a difficult time, what's it say they did? They leaned into that relationship and God filled them with joy in the Holy Spirit. They were, they were given power in a difficult circumstance. They were given power to do a difficult thing. Do you see a little bit of the correlation now? They were given power to do something difficult, like being persecuted. Imagine a time, now hear me out really quick. I only got a couple minutes. The band's coming up. This is my fear. This is my fear. Can we just agree we got it pretty sweet, don't we, in the United States? I know, you watch the news, you're like, man, we're going to hell. Um, <laughs> I know, okay, but listen, we're all meeting here in the air condition in a beautiful building. We got a campus in Berkeley Springs doing it, campus in Concord doing it. We can start a campus on every street corner if we want to. There's no risk. We do whatever we want, right? Come on, can we say amen to that? Okay. My fear is if we can't resist sin now, how will we deal with persecution later? When we read about the New Testament church, we read about a church that suffered. And I'm looking now and going, whoa, 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 whoa. If our relationship with God isn't enough where he can empower us just to say no to this thing, how in the world would we ever stand up to any real persecution? They called me a name on Twitter or whatever it is now. <laughs> Come on, really? Let's just resist sin. We're not being persecuted. COVID wasn't a persecution. We got to get we got to get a relationship in, with him enough to resist sin. If we can't resist sin, how do you ever think we'd ever stand up to any real opposition? I can't say no to sin, so I'm definitely not going to say no to this God that doesn't want me to do this. The church will fold. And that's what we've seen historically. A church that can't live a holy life cannot stand up under opposition. Look through history. And when we start lowering the standards because our relationships went south, because we wanted a verse of the day, because we wanted something that made us just feel better in the moment. The early church prioritized being full of the spirit for righteous living. Their relationship with Christ was not an add on to make their life easier. It was what saved them and set them free. 
They were committed to continually investing in that relationship and that allowed them to resist sin and persevere in difficult times. And those two characteristics go hand in hand. Stand up, I wanna end with this. Um, If I told you today that I had a million dollars in my pocket, which wouldn't fit, but anyway, let's just go with it. Uh, If I had a million dollars in my pocket, but you had to wait for it, how long would you wait? A million dollars might set you free financially. A million dollars might could change your life. Let's call it 10 million. That would that's enough to change everybody's life. Let's call it 10 million. How how long would you wait for 10 million dollars? If I said the last person standing up here gets 10 million dollars. There'd be divorces after it. All you had to do was stand here. You had one thing to do. We love You know how it would go down. $10 million could set you free temporarily. And yet God says, wait on me and I will renew your strength. If you wait on me, I'll renew your strength. What do I need strength for? I need strength to resist sin. I need strength to stand up under opposition. I need strength, not strength to work, not strength to, oh, I gotta get up in the morning and do the hard thing. No, he says, if you wait on me, I'll give you strength. And we need that more and more and more. I'm tired of looking at people. We're a church full of sinners. We're a church full of people that have been set free from sin and death. And I'm surrounded by a group of people that know what's right and know what's wrong and are heaven bent on doing those things. And we spend enough time with God to get it right most of the time. The testimony of the church to the world is that when you spend time with Christ, you become more like Him, free. Amen? So hold on a second, hold on a second. Stop playing, stop playing. Stop playing. So. So this last scripture, really quick, Isaiah 40, 31. But they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. I'm challenging you this week, just wait on them a little bit. Like when you're in your car, say, God, I need you to empower me with your Holy Spirit to resist sin at work. You know I sin at work. I need you to empower me, Lord. I want to resist this. I want to put this to death. I need you to empower me to do it. So we used to sing a song back in the day. Does anybody remember it? Now, now, hold on. Stop everything. Stop everything. Because I forgot the key. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew theirs. Some of you know it. They shall mount up with wings as eagles and they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to wait. Father, we just ask that this morning. Lord, in the hustle and bustle of the 21st century where our phones are in our face nonstop all the time, where there's so many demands on our life from culture, we pray, Lord, that we would be a church that learned to wait on you. Not just on Sunday morning, God, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday. Because our freedom depends on it. Like not being captive to sin anymore but having the power to overcome and put it to death in our lives. You established the morality and you then you gave us the power to live it. And I pray that you'd empower every person according to their relationship with you, Lord. And I pray we'd learn to wait in Jesus' mighty name. Could you give him praise and honor this morning? Come on, my prayer is he'd empower you, amen?